from Mississippi Solo, memoir by Eddie Harris. Too many marvelous days in a row, and you begin to get used to it, to think that's the way it's supposed to be. Too many good days, too many bad days. You need some break in the monotony of one to appreciate the other. If you only get sunshine, someone said, you end up in a desert. I guess I'd had enough hard days to last me for a while, enough scary times to be able to appreciate the peaceful, easy, glorious days. On the way to Natchez, I had another one, and I took full advantage of it to do absolutely nothing. No singing, no thinking, no talking to myself, just feeling. Watching the river, noticing the changes in color, seeing the way it rises and falls depending on the wind and on what lies on the riverbed. Each change had something to say, and I listened to the river. The river was talking to me, changing colors from puce to brown to thick murky green, saying nothing. The idle chatter you get when you walk with your favorite niece or nephew going no place in particular, with nothing special on your minds, and the little kid just jabbers away because it's comfortable, and he feels like it. The river was like that to me. A comfortable buddy sharing a lazy day. Nothing else mattered then. Going someplace or not, arriving in New Orleans, or shooting past and landing in Brazil. I didn't care about anything. The river kept me company and kept me satisfied. Nothing else mattered. Then the river whispered, Get ready. Get ready. The day turned gray and strange. Clouds rolled overhead and wild swirls like batter in a bowl. I could see the rainstorm forming off in the distance, but swirling rapidly toward me, like a dark gray avalanche. I felt the river dip down and up, a shallow dale in the water. I passed from the cool moisture surrounding me and into a pocket of thin air, hot and dry. It was as though a gap had opened in the clouds and the sun streamed through to boil the water and heat up this isolated patch of river, a scant thirty yards long. My first thought was to shed a shirt and stay cool, but when I passed through the far curtain of the insulated air, I knew I had better do just the opposite. I drifted and donned my yellow rain suit and hood. The sky above grew serious and advanced in my direction, with the speed of a hurricane. Looking for a place to land, I scanned the shore. There was no shore, only trees. Because of the heavy rains and high water, the shore had disappeared, and the new shoreline of solid earth had been pushed back through the trees and beyond the woods. How far beyond, I couldn't tell. I looked across to the other side of the river half a mile away. No way could I have made it over there. Halfway across, the wind would have kicked up and trapped me in the middle. The leading edge of the storm came, and the first sprinkles passed over like army scouts. The wooded area lasted only another hundred yards or so, and I thought I could easily get there before the rains arrived. I could then turn left and find ground to pull out and wait out the storm. But the voice of the river came out and spoke to me teasingly, but with a chill of seriousness down my spine. I could have ignored it, but as if reading my thoughts and not wanting me to fight it, the river grabbed the end of the canoe and turned me toward the trees. I thought I was looking for land. I wasn't. I was looking for shelter. The urge to get into the trees came on me quite suddenly, and really without thought or effort on my part, almost an instinct. No sooner had I ducked into the trees than the sky split open with a loud crash and a splintery crackle of lightning. I was not going to make it through the trees. The wind came in at hurricane strength. The tips of the trees bent way over and aimed toward the ground, like fishing rods hooked on a big one. Water flooded like the tide rushing upstream. The trees swooshed loudly as the leaves and branches brushed hard together. Branches fell. Rains came and poured down bucketfuls. 
The trees were tall and no more than three feet around. I maneuvered the canoe as best I could in the wind and rushing water, turned it to face upstream, and kept my back to the rain which slanted in at a sharp angle. I reached out for the sturdiest tree I could get my arms around, and I held on. Water everywhere. The river sloshed over the side and into the canoe. I tried to keep the stern pointed right into the flow so the canoe could ride the waves, but it didn't work. The canoe was twisted about, and water poured over the side. The rain was heavier than any I had ever been in or seen before. It really was more like a tropical storm. The heavy winds, the amount of water, the warmth of the air, and the cold rain. Only my neck was exposed to the rain. When the rain hit my neck, it ran under the rain suit and very cold down my back. The wind shifted as a storm came directly overhead. Water streamed straight down. I was drenched, and the canoe was filling up quickly. Anything in the canoe that could float was floating. If the rain continued for long, or if the wind kept up strong and the rain kept spilling into the canoe, I would sink. But I was not worried, hardly more than concerned. In fact, I enjoyed the feeling of the water all around me and on me, enveloping me like a cocoon. And despite the drama, I felt no real threat. I was more amazed than anything, trying to analyze the voice I had heard or whatever instinct or intuition it was that urged me to park in these trees. It had been something so very definite that I could feel it, and yet so ethereal that I could not put my finger on it. So I stopped trying and just sat there patiently, waiting and hugging my tree. I was one with this river, and nothing could happen to me. The storm slid forward, and the rain slanted in on my face. Then it moved on farther up the river to drench someone else. It was gone as suddenly as it had arisen. Only the trailing edge was left, a light rain that lasted, almost, until I reached Natchez. Forward, and the rain slanted in on my face. Then it moved on farther up the river to drench someone else. It was gone as suddenly as it had arisen, Only the trailing edge was left, a light rain that lasted, almost, until I reached Natchez. The river was like that to me, a comfortable buddy sharing a lazy day. Nothing else mattered then, going someplace or not. Arriving in New Orleans or shooting past and landing in Brazil. I didn't care about anything. The river kept me company and kept me satisfied. Nothing else mattered. This is a calm passage. It lets you feel like all is right in the world. There's this man on the river having a lazy day. And I know this is a memoir, so in this case the man on the river is also the author. I like the simile he uses. The river was like a comfortable buddy sharing a lazy day. And it seems he has a destination, New Orleans. But if he shoots past and heads to Brazil, hey, that's okay too. I notice he repeats that idea of being carefree. Nothing else mattered. I didn't care about anything. And he also continues that simile of the river being a friend when he says the river kept him company. So maybe it felt like he wasn't alone. Then the river whispered, get ready, get ready. The day turned gray and strange. Clouds rolled in overhead in wild swirls like batter in a bowl. Suddenly the mood and the setting are changing. Right. The river is not yelling or screaming that something terrible is coming, and yet it seems like something terrible is coming. He describes the clouds as rolling in, wild swirls like batter in a bowl. I can picture a sky like that, clouds moving quickly, maybe rippling across the sky. Batter in a bowl makes me think of baking a cake. It's comforting, not like storm clouds at all. Well, maybe the comparison is maybe about how wild the swirls look. Maybe they are crazy, like something in a whipping bowl would look. That might be it. You sort of know that it's dangerous for clouds to be so thick and dense that it means a bad storm is coming but it's presented in a sort of non-threatening way, like he's on this journey with the river and things will happen, but he's going to take what comes in stride.
The river was like that to me, a comfortable buddy sharing a lazy day. Nothing else mattered then, going someplace or not, arriving in New Orleans or shooting past and landing in Brazil. I didn't care about anything. The river kept me company and kept me satisfied. Nothing else mattered. This is a calm passage. It lets you feel like all is right in the world. There's this man on the river having a lazy day. And I know this is a memoir, so in this case the man on the river is also the author. I like the simile he uses. The river was like a comfortable buddy sharing a lazy day. And it seems he has a destination, New Orleans. But if he shoots past and heads to Brazil, hey, that's okay too. I notice he repeats that idea of being carefree. Nothing else mattered. I didn't care about anything. And he also continues that simile of the river being a friend when he says the river kept him company. So maybe it felt like he wasn't alone. Then the river whispered, get ready, get ready. The day turned gray and strange. Clouds rolled in overhead in wild swirls like batter in a bowl. Suddenly the mood and the setting are changing. Right. The river is not yelling or screaming that something terrible is coming, and yet it seems like something terrible is coming. He describes the clouds as rolling in wild swirls like batter in a bowl. I can picture a sky like that, clouds moving quickly, maybe rippling across the sky. Batter in a bowl makes me think of baking a cake. It's comforting, not like storm clouds at all. Well, maybe the comparison is maybe about how wild the swirls look. Maybe they are crazy, like something in a whipping bowl would look. That might be it. You sort of know that it's dangerous for clouds to be so thick and dense that it means a bad storm is coming. But it's presented in a sort of non-threatening way, like he's on this journey with the river and things will happen. But he's going to take what comes in stride. Have you ever heard someone tell a story and thought, I felt like I was there. I could smell the grass. I could hear the crowd. I could feel the breeze. I could see what she was describing. If so, you know how to visualize a text. When you visualize, you bring to life in your mind the descriptions and language of a text. You see and feel the text in your imagination. And sometimes understanding a text demands that you visualize it, whether that text is fiction or nonfiction. In Mississippi Solo, Eddie Harris wants you to share a real experience he had canoeing on the Mississippi River and getting stuck in a big storm. And he shares that experience through vivid descriptions. But what if a text is just not turning into pictures for you? Where do you start? Try this. First, pause after you read each scene or paragraph, especially if it's about something unfamiliar to you. Visualizing sometimes takes a bit of effort and might even involve rereading. Next, look at how the writer describes things. Does he use similes or metaphors? Remember, similes and metaphors compare unlike things that have something in common, and they can help you visualize. For example, the writer uses a simile to compare the first sprinkles to army scouts. This description helps you imagine a few scattered drops that soon increase to a whole army of rain. Finally, ask yourself, what sense does each description connect to? Is it something that you can see, hear, smell, taste, or feel? Let's look at some details. No sooner had I ducked into the trees than the sky split open with a loud crash and a splintery crackle of lightning. Pause and hear that crash and crackle. The tips of the trees bent way over and aimed toward the ground, like fishing rods hooked on a big one. Pause and visualize this scene. Harris is using a simile, like fishing rods hooked on a big one, to help you understand how these trees bent. So imagine fishing rods hooked on a big fish, and then picture the tips bending down. Rains came and poured down bucketfuls. Now it's really starting to rain. See it come down, not in drops, but in bucketfuls. Here, Harris is using a metaphor comparing the rain to buckets full of water. 
So, as you read on, stop and visualize the text. Think about what the language means and how your senses can help you bring the descriptions alive. From Mississippi Solo Avalanche A large mass of snow, ice, dirt, or rocks falling quickly down the side of the mountain. An avalanche can bury people under many feet of, of snow. Insulate You prevent the passage of heat through something. You can stay warm in cold weather if you insulate yourself. Splinter To break up into sharp, thin pieces. The sky split open with a loud crash and a splintery crackle of lightning. Ethereal Light She has an ethereal voice, but the song she sang was powerful. Puce Purplish-brown The river was changing colors from puce to brown to thick. Dale Valley I felt the river dip down and up a shallow dale in the water. Scant Just short of, little, not enough. She pays scant attention to the needs of Ho's children. Swirl. To move quickly with a twisting, circular movement. The storm was forming off in the distance swirling rapidly towards me like a dark grey avalanche. Canoe. A small light narrow boat. I maneuvered the canoe as best with the old. I could in the wind and rushing water. Maneuvered. To handle and move something carefully or with difficulty. I maneuvered the canoe as best I could in the wind and rushing water. Swooshed. To make the sound of air or water that move quickly. The trees swooshed loudly as the leaves and branches brushed hard together. <laughs> 